let's meet our panelists. We have got Cordell Johnson, we've got Alicia Mansarolo, we've got Celia Morgan, and we've got Oliver Milburn. Hello, guys, come and join us. This is where. Hey. Hey. Hello, everyone. Here we are. Here they are. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for joining us today and, and taking the time out. Um, welcome to Radio One Connects. This is all about TV and film industry. I, I make it no secret, I'm a bit of a radio geek, but I'm really excited to do this today because I also love television and film. So to get to speak to you guys about your jobs is something I'm really looking forward to. Uh, and this, if you are joining us for the first time, is a series of free career advice sessions from Radio One helping you to kickstart your career in various creative industries. We have sessions on music business, social media and marketing, radio fashion, podcasts, music production, film and TV and events. And you can sign up to any of them for free and find out the dates over on the Radio One website. And if you've missed any of these sessions or maybe you're watching now and you've got a friend or someone you're at uni with or, I don't know, a cousin, they can go back to watch them on the BBC Careers YouTube channel. So thanks to everybody that's joined us and thanks again to our guests. I've got loads of questions. Um, so uh, who do I start with really first? Um, Alicia, tell us what a day in the life of, in fact, actually you should, you should introduce yourself. So Alicia, just briefly tell us what your job is. Yeah, um, lovely to meet you all. Um, my name's Alicia, I am a casting producer, um, which means that I basically find people that want to be on TV and kind of make that happen, really, in a nutshell. Okay, and Celia, just briefly tell us about your role and what you do. Hiya, so I'm Celia and I'm a full-time TV writer. Um, so probably the main show you'll have heard of that I write on is EastEnders, I also do like a few bits of kids shows. I've done Horrible Histories, Jamie Johnson and a few bits and bobs coming up and some of my own stuff as well. Nice. And Cordell, tell us about your job and what you do. Um, I'm a DV director, so I help like just shoot and kind of semi put together stories when we're doing like, I guess, documentary style reality TV shows. Oh, nice. I'll have lots of questions for you. Don't worry about that. And Oliver, tell us what your role is in the industry. Hello. Uh, lovely to be here. I'm a writer and director principally of feature films. So, um, you know, 90 minute films that you would have seen in the cinema uh, if they haven't been closed for the last few years, um, for the last year. And uh, yeah, I, I write and direct those. And I also uh, have worked in visual effects as in computer CGI um, a fair bit. So as you can see, a great panel today um, with all different jobs in the TV and film industry. So if you've got any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom to send them in at any time during the session. You don't have to put your hand up or anything like that. Just send them in and uh, we'll do our best to answer them and I'll try my best to read them out at the end. So Alicia, tell us what a day in the life of a casting producer is like and what what is a casting producer, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, no, 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 no worries. I actually weirdly didn't know that this job existed until I kind of got to it. But um, yeah, no, so I basically, all, all the people you might see on TV, um, whether it's on a reality show or a documentary or an entertainment show, kind of have to be found by somebody and led through that process. So I kind of find those people that want to be on TV, um, I find good characters that have like, amazing stories to tell and, and put them on TV essentially and do everything in between. So my job involves a lot of talking, a lot of talking, which yep. I'm fine with. Um, I love to chat. And yeah, so, so like, I guess a kind of day for me would be, it depends what show I'm working on really. I've worked on shows like The Voice, um, The Rap Game, The Circle. I've done casting on Team Mom and, and stuff like that. So it kind of depends. Finding people, I'm on Instagram and social media all day. Um, forums, YouTube, just to kind of find these people that might be relevant or good for the show I'm working on. So yeah, my job kind of involves a lot of reaching out to people, chatting to them, finding out their stories and kind of leading them through the process until they're on screen really. So when we watch Circle, love it by the way, 
When we watch the circle, am I right in saying that not all of them have applied? Sometimes they've been approached by people like yourself. That's your yeah. job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on, on the show, you know, th there will be lots of people that apply and like, we always would welcome that. But, but actually, you know, our job as, as casting producers, casting assistant producers is to go out and find those people that, you know, have, like I said, like amazing stories to tell and are good characters, um, you know, because we want to make the best, the best show. So, yeah, we kind of do like half and half, I think. A lot, you know, a lot of people do apply, but sometimes we will reach out to people. Ah, nice one. Uh, Cordell, can you give us a bit more insight into what being a videographer and director is like? Like, what, what sort of things do you do behind the scenes? And well, from being a videographer, it's more about just like capturing the essence of the moment or just just figuring out like, how you want to portray or tell a story on screen. Um, in terms of being a director, it's, a, it's slightly different. It's kind of like controlling everything that's on the set. It, but, but it depends on what you're doing, because I work in so many different industries. You want to like get specific to one of them. Yeah, so tell us more about well, what what would you rather TV or film? What would yeah? What would you rather talk about? What what do you like the most? Like, I I could read off information for anything you want to hear about. <laughs> uh, um, tell us, uh, tell us about TV. Tell us what it's like for TV. So TV for me is a little bit more structured. So it's like. In terms of being a director, the type of shows I've worked on, it's more about understanding the talent that you're working with and how to interact with them and, and learning how to extract the information according to the story that they want to produce. Also, it's, it's about learning on the fly about stories that can possibly manifest that are not anything to do with the story. So it's like, it's weird. It's a, it's a position where you have to consistently just be on your toes but just be aware of your surroundings and kind of be aware of what's required of you to do that particular job. I don't know if that, that answered your question completely. No, definitely. You, you said there you, you kind of you have to think on your feet. Is, is that, would you say that's a skill you've got to adapt all the time? In, in yeah, this 100%. Yeah, that's something I've learned and yeah, that's, that's one of the most needed skills I reckon to be a director because not the type of shows I do, not, not everything always goes to plan. So you kind of have to, if yeah. adapt, you can figure out how to make sure, even if you don't get what's required, how do you get something that can still carry the story, if that makes sense? Yeah. And would you agree, like, sometimes the best way of learning is you just got to jump in at the deep end, haven't you? And Personally, like for me, it. that's no the way. only way to learn. Like, I have never learned anything to do with directing from a book or from maybe like a philosophy of somebody telling me something. I have to be there on the day I'd either get it right or mess it up and either either it would tell me okay this is how you do it next time okay nice one Oliver uh, you're a writer and director so what's the process of seeing an idea all the way through to a script like that must be quite really good as a creative to write it and then see it on screen yeah yeah and I think um they're they're they're, they're two um quite different things and it's sort of um if you're a control freak like me, you want to do both, but they're quite they're quite sort of different talents. And um, um, the the writing side of it, yeah, is I mean, um, uh, it is very much just about uh, telling a story on the page um, in a way that it can be filmed. The funny thing, I mean, uh, uh, Celia could probably talk with much more expertise than me about this, but the, the funny thing I always find about a script is you you imagine it, it it's almost not like a it's not a, a supposed to, it's nice if it's a fun thing to read, but really it's a blueprint for a film or a TV show or a whatever it is you're going to shoot. It's the, it's the information that the director needs to, to shoot that film properly um, or that TV show or that whatever. So yeah, so it's in the case of my um, most recent film that just came out, School's Out Forever, that was a book first. It was a book I found in a, in a library that I really liked. And so the process of the scripting you're talking about it was, was essentially adapting that um, so that it would make a good movie because they're two two very very different very different things um for, for for so many reasons and then as a director your job is um is very very collaborative it's not i think it's always it's often sold as this kind of um you know you're the you're the artist on like the great artist running everything but actually all you're doing is working with an amazing crew of people who are all 
really good in their own little specialisms that you can't do um, and and telling them kind of what you're after and hoping that you know they can they can get you there um, by lighting it brilliantly like Cordell would do or, or, or casting it brilliantly or you know what, what, whatever your your job as the director is basically to just oversee it and, and try and get it to whatever the the, the design end is. So it's your vision and you've got to like put your vision across to all those people that are working on the project so like need to communicate that that must be hard at times. Yeah exactly and, and that's why I say they're two very different things as in when you're writing it's you're everything you're the whole universe and you're this this voice that's putting it on the page and you're you know and then when you go to direct it exactly it's about it's about working with people and and, and really understanding and appreciating what they do and 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 knowing when to I guess kind of think they know better than me really like about how to achieve this thing I want to achieve you know some, sometimes you're going to people and yeah. saying I this is what I want but I have no idea how to do it can you tell me and then other times you're saying I want you to do this like this and they may disagree and you have to be a bit firm and say no this is how we do it and it's a real mix of those two two things I think Oh, well, I am geeking out right now. This is ace. This is so good. Uh, Celia, adding on to that, in what ways does um, TV writing differ to film writing like Oliver? Is it quite similar? Um, I guess in some ways it's similar, especially if you're um, working on your own original content, then the process at the start will be the same, really, but you will then work with a director or let it go to a director. But if you're coming into an existing show, the cool thing is like there's this world already exists. You've already got these characters that people know they live in people's homes on their TV. So it's quite exciting to like jump in and like create your part of this world and have your little input in the way that you can. And I think what's nice about with existing shows as well is it's very collaborative then because it's not just it's not just my version of what's happening with these people it's all of us working together and then you just find your little ways to get a bit of a bit of your personal flair in there as well if you can but, yeah is it right I, I heard like with writers once you've the script's been commissioned you kind of have to let go then and trust the director don't you how how do you find that on the shows that I've worked on so far like there's often a very strict sort of process so um you might um like for example EastEnders is a bit different because it's like a faster paced kind of thing that doesn't end but for most of the other shows you have a process of like you'll outline your episode you'll get an episode commission you'll outline it you'll do a scene by scene and then you'll get to the point of writing your actual episode and you'll have like a number of drafts already outlined for you that you need to do so like I always like to think you know I'm going to do my best job in this first draft and I'll get no notes and that's just it but that is never happens like it's written into the contract oh. how, how many drafts you're going to have to do so you always have to be ready for notes no matter how experienced you are but then once you've got to that final draft point and the script is ready publish or go into rehearsal then you're completely out of it at that point unless it's your own show then you'll still be involved but otherwise yeah it's just just that's it it's gone and then you get like an just quickly say sorry um, just quickly when you do the drafts do you always look back and think right that this fourth draft is definitely better than the first draft Sometimes it's like that, yeah, definitely. And then sometimes it's just things change on the show or somebody did something really exciting in another episode that has a knock-on effect on everybody else's episode or you uh, might be more okay. than that. So sometimes, yeah, it just changes because it just evolves naturally through the drafting process of other episodes. But sometimes, yeah, I'm like, oh, my God, why did I put that in that first draft? What was I thinking? <laughs> Uh, oh, great. So uh, just to recap, this is Radio One Connect. Uh, welcome to the session. If you've got a question for our panellists, please write it in the Q&A function on the Zoom uh, and send it at any time. And hopefully we will read them out uh, towards the end of the session. And the aim today is for you guys that are watching 
to understand the different roles in TV and the film industries and how, how to get your foot in the door, which um, leads me to my next question. Alicia, how did you start out in the industry and what was your journey to become a casting producer like? Did you leave uni and go straight into it or did you even go to university? Yeah, I did. I I did go to university. Um, firstly, with with my job, like there's quite a few sort of positions beforehand. So like if you in television, like an entry level job is what you would call um, a runner or a logger. So you kind of do sort of like basic levels of like television. So you might assist with casting, etc. And then you go up to like a researcher and then you go to a assistant producer and then you go to a producer. So I've actually just become like a producer, which is good. Um, but no, like I went to uni, I actually did drama and English. I kind of wanted to be an actress and I left uni and didn't really know. I, I didn't think acting was for me, I wasn't really sure. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it, basically. So I kind of had like a million different jobs. I was working like in bars, in restaurants. I worked at hairdressers as well. And basically I was just, I think I was just in the right place at the right time because one of my friends had got um, sort of like a, an entry level job at ITV and just said, oh, I think you'd be really good at like what I'm doing. And there was like, I was like, no way would I ever get this job. I've got like no experience. I'm literally, I'm, you know, I'm working in the hairdressers. There'll, there'll be tons of people that have more experience than me. And I kind of just went to the interview and just thought, oh yeah, like, let's just go for it. And I got the job. So I was really lucky to kind of get in really. I, I think one thing actually I would say just about TV in general, like you don't really need any sort of like specific qualifications, which which I think is amazing. Um, I didn't need to have like a TV and film degree. I mean, I had a degree, but I, I know loads of my mates that actually haven't been to uni, left school at 16 or did A-levels and, you know, at, at my level and even higher. So yeah, that's one good thing about the industry. You don't need to have a specific qualification. Um, in something but yeah like the industry is amazing it's really fun I definitely think that if you're like a people's person and you like chatting to people and finding out about people's lives and stories like casting it might be sort of the route for you for sure sorry my earphones keep falling out as Great. well <laughs> no don't worry mine always do that I think it's because I've got really small ears <laughs> And mine all constantly do it. Oliver, before you uh, got to where you were now, you worked in visual effects. So how did you get from there to where you are now? Was it quite a long journey? Yeah, um, v uh, very long, but but sort of also simultaneous. I mean, it was like kind of like um, living a bit of a dual life. But the weird thing is there was always points of crossover and actually... Um, um, you know, there's there's a there's a version in which I could say, oh, I was a VFX supervisor who wanted to be a director, but actually, I don't think I'd have got to be a director if I hadn't been a VFX supervisor, um, because of the people I met and the the sort of crossover. Like when it when it came time to direct my first feature with a proper budget, the, the fact that I had supervised VFX supervised TV shows really played into them letting me direct it. Um, so I guess. Um, that's all a bit obviously in the, in the future maybe for a lot of uh, like uh, watchers but the, the point being like I, I think you know those other skills you learn and those other roles you do are so important and 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 you know to not not to sort of ignore that in favor of you know just like I want to be a whatever it is you want to be and that's all I'm prepared to do and that's the only direction I'm prepared to go in it's like um you know all the twists in the road are really important and 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 i i think you know i i'm trying to think of a terrible metaphor that the vfx and the directing were like two rungs of the same ladder or something they were going to the you know going to the same place or something awful like that apologies for that um the point being um uh, yeah i i think i i did um i left uni and um i made my my grad film at uni i was lucky enough to get released we made like a feature length film as our grad film and it got released and to the point of like uni I think it's a really interesting question um, because I definitely agree that there's no there's no qualification needed to work in this industry but the person I made that grad okay. film was was is the is the is the person who produced my last feature film and, and I met her there and so you know you have you have these big circular journeys with a 
with sort of through lines of all the different other little jobs you're doing and stuff. So I don't know. It's but then you also meet people if you just go if you if you just start straight away at a runner's job. So either way, it's about meeting people, I guess, and um, and doing the VFX. Also, of course, skills. I mean, Cordell could probably talk to this, uh, but but skills are just so important. Like the actual, you know, your 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 art. If, if you want to be on set, if you want to be standing there directing something or, you know, physically doing the thing, the skills are just as important as whatever, um, you know, artistic brain you might have, the, the, you know, the knowledge of what this person's doing or what that person's doing or why it's important, you know, um, all that stuff is so important and the VFX really helped in that. Um, um, but the, the shortest answer to your question is they, like, they, they didn't directly overlap at any point. I didn't get Nobody who I was doing VFX for went, will you come and direct this thing for me? It was sort of simultaneous things, but they definitely informed and helped each other move forward. Yeah, I, could. I mean, um, Cordell, would, when you was uh, younger, did you ever plan to work in the, you know, the, the TV film industry? Because you've worked with loads of high profile celebrities like Burner Boy and H. Um, did you ever think, did you know at school how to get in the industry? Was was it something you always wanted to do? No, do you know what? The funny thing is, is like in the beginning, I actually wanted to be a graphic designer. So when I went to uni, I studied graphic design, which was nothing to do with directing. But the course that I was on was called New Media. So they covered like web design, photography, a little bit of video, animation, 3D design. And I kind of just played around with it. But, you know, when you go to uni, you have access to the equipment. So... Um, someone I know wanted to do freestyle. So I grabbed the camera and I shot it. Like I, I literally had one job and messed it up. <laughs> like, all I had to do was <laughs> <get> it. <laughs> and just film the freestyle, but I messed it up. So I ended up having to edit it. And then whilst I was in the editing process, I was kind of like, do you know what? I actually enjoy the process of editing. And then over that, the duration, like I think luckily I was in the, I don't know, the um the come up of like DSLR cameras so everybody started realizing they could actually shoot full-length music videos on DSLR so I was in that generation so literally I picked up a camera and just started trying to shoot with it and that kind of birthed in my career but I realized very quickly that I was very rubbish at what I did so <laughs> I, needed <to> get, <laughs> I needed to get a job for me like I'm I'm a very impatient person when it comes to stuff like that so I wanted to get a job with the professionals to know exactly why do you do this? How do you shoot? How do you like something? Like, how do you go about, what's the best way about doing it? But um, it's weird because my, my process was like, it's fun, just like Alicia, I worked in a nightclub as well as like, like a part-time thing, but my, my thing was networking. So it was like, how do I network in the most efficient way? Which was at the time, I wasn't actually even full-time in, in, in the nightclub. I used to work in Electric Brixton. So I said to myself, do you know what? The cloak cream could hold, if I remember, up to 3,000 coats. I said to myself, okay, I'm going to take the, the managerial role of the cloakroom and get all these people come to me as opposed to me having to go to loads of different events. And luckily it worked. So I met this, I can't even remember the girl's name. She had purple hair and she said she worked at BBC. So I was like, wait, <laughs> you don't look like someone that could work in the BBC. So how did you get there? She, she explained to me about this course called, well, it wasn't really a course. It's more like a training program called Mama Youth. Um, so I, I literally followed them there and then um, applied for it and like the, my interview was trash <laughs> completely <laughs> trash like I messed up the interview but I was so determined to get it like, I, I got home and I realized what happened and I, I remember calling them and I was like listen like, I know my interview was trash but I'm telling you now there's nobody you're going to recruit that has the brain that I have and then once I went through that training program that was like a, a three-month course and they taught us how to like produce how to shoot and um, we worked with everybody on the crew was like fresh nobody knew anything about production um, but we all came up together and after that I had a placement in Sky and then I met this director in Sky called Jules and like do you know it's weird because my brain is very abstract and that was the first time I met somebody that could give me context to the way I thought about things and even the way like when he was explaining things to me about like um, the, the main director, um, the, the gallery director being late or like new camera ops. He, this guy is literally explaining to me how everything works on the set, but at the same time, he's having simultaneous conversations. So he's explaining to me about 
how the lighting works. And then out of nowhere, he's gone, oh, yeah, to patch into that box, you need to plug this thing over here. And I'm looking at him like, but he was fully in conversation with me. How was you engaging with something that was happening over there? And he was like, yeah, like I can, I can simultaneously do things. So he kind of showed me like how my brain worked. And that was like the beginning of realizing that, wow. okay, I think I want to direct. Because he was able to, to simultaneously yeah. just, just look into loads of different things at one time. So that, that was like, that kind of like opened my brain slightly. And after I finished my placement at Sky, I ended up at, where did I go next? I think I was at Big Brother for, I think two series. But by the end of the second series, I got myself in a position where they offered me to do camera. So that that was like weird because I went essentially straight from a runner to being qualified to be in a camera up. Like, and that's like nobody right. has ever done anything like that. Do you know what I mean? But it was just like my shared determination because I kind of saw it when I was on the Big Brother set. Like, okay, well, I'm here right now. This isn't guaranteed to come back to me again. Literally anything I wanted to know and learn, I asked every single question you can think of under the sun. Like, why does the sound work? Why do you say this in the gallery? How does that work? To the point, one of the directors, I'm not going to say their names, <laughs> they didn't really know what they was doing, but I studied it so hard. I literally jumped on the console. I was like, okay, you know, like, if you go to this camera, it's easier to access through this place and that place. And then the lady was like to me, what, do you know how to do it? And I was like, yeah, I've been studying this for like the last month. She was like, okay, jump on the console. I was literally, unofficially, I didn't get the credit, obviously, because I was there as a runner, but I was directing on a live show and nobody knew the difference. The, the story producer that was sitting behind me, ironically, um, is the person that gave me the job on, um, that put me forward for the rap game. I haven't actually met Alicia, but like I worked on rap game series too. Um, she didn't realise that it was me that was directing on the console. So like that, all of that kind of just helped birth my idea that I wanted to direct. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, Celia, tell us about your path to becoming a writer. Was it something that you always wanted to do? Well, actually, like Alicia, I did drama at uni. I did a drama degree. Um, and then for my dissertation, like the way it worked on my course is a lot of people would get in groups and produce a play and work together. But I didn't want to do that. Like I wanted to do something I could do on my own. Um, so writing was that thing. Um, so I wrote my first, like my first real script for my dissertation at uni and I just really loved doing it. Like, cause just generally, like I was always obsessed with typewriters when I was a kid because my mom had this really cool typewriter and I also loved Murder, She Wrote. But then like to actually <laughs> start, start doing the writing, like in a proper way at uni, um, I just loved it. I really enjoyed making people laugh. Like I... I love people watching. I just, I'm interested in people's lives and stuff. Um, so it kind of came together from there. And then I went on to do a master's in writing for stage and broadcast um, at Central School of Speech and Drama in London. Um, but then what happened really, again, a bit like Alicia, um, I ended up just moving into like various roles within TV because to be a writer, you can't always just go straight out and get a job doing it to pay the bills for sure anyway. Um, so I was working in loads of peripheral jobs in telly. Like I wrote, I did the subtitles for years on um, shows. And then uh, I was like a runner on Newsnight for a little bit and I never wanted to do anything in sort of news or factual. Um, but anyway, I ended up then working in a development department at the BBC actually. And that was good because it was related to the writing and I got to understand a bit more about the world and like all the different roles. One thing actually that when you said earlier about like things um, you wish you had known when you were starting out, I wish that I had known there were yeah. so many other jobs like related to like making a TV show that would appeal to somebody with a writing background. Like I didn't really know that much about script editors or storyliners or, you know, development assistants at production companies. When I started out, I didn't, I actually did not know about all of those roles. Um, and I mean, it might give away my age, but <laughs> there weren't so many schemes and like TV kind of opportunities back then. Like this was kind of before all the on-demand services and the SVODs and the Netflixes and all that. 
so there wasn't as much content being made so there weren't so many schemes like to get you in but now like I think anybody thinking about tv or wanting to kind of explore that role like Cordell said mama youth is a brilliant um in this, um incentive to get young people in and there's loads of things like that there's loads of ways you can get involved now and learn about those different different career paths so eventually for me how I got right in full time is I quit the job altogether I realized that doing all these kind of peripheral jobs in tv were never going to get me a job writing tv just didn't work like that and I took some time out focused on my writing and started submitting to competitions and then that's what got me cutting through like I started winning competitions and stuff then I got an agent and then it all really kind of took off from there. Great um guys really really good we're already uh, just past halfway through the session so we're going to go to uh, the question and answers those you remember if you've got any questions and answers just write them in in uh, the comments box and we will try your try our best to read them out uh, before we go to the q a could you all summarize in a sentence one piece of advice you would tell someone who wanted to start a career doing what you do so we'll go to you alicia first one piece of advice you could sum it up um i i think just I think just don't if, if you don't have it don't worry basically if you don't have any experience in this industry like that's one thing and I think yeah just don't be don't be scared to like write email after email to companies that like I honestly have I mean this is probably really embarrassing to a bit but I've written like eight emails to companies before just to get them to kind of acknowledge me or get to know me so just like do it like it literally doesn't hurt like just if you want to do something yeah just go at it full throttle I think. And quickly, what's the best thing about your job? The best thing about my job is I honestly get to talk to the most amazing people you can ever meet. Like I've, like I worked on One Born Every Minute. So I've interviewed like pregnant mums that are just about to have a baby. Um, you know, like I, I've, I've interviewed sort of like up and coming rappers, you know, I've, yeah, I've worked on lots of different shows. So I think really kind of sitting down and talking to people and learning about you know their lives and kind of putting that on tv is just yeah it's phenomenal it's the best thing about it oliver one piece of advice to anybody that wants to become a, a writer or director um i think like uh keep keep that passion alive always but be open-minded and just uh, i think we've heard from a lot of everyone here kind of saying uh to some extent you know experiences are great um, learn different skills just just work hard and, and keep the passion alive keep an open mind and um, see where you get and if you don't end up exactly where you planned that's also fine and could be a good great thing and and the best thing about your job quickly oh uh the people I get to work with and then just I mean I just love drama making drama and and getting to make it with the particular kind of people you get to make it with Cordell, uh, your one bit of advice for anybody what, that wants to do the sort of thing that you do, being a director and videographer. Um, a common one that I get uh, is how do you get in and how do you get noticed? Um, I'd say times have changed. Uh, don't be afraid to just create your own stuff because if if you're trying to land a big job and nobody's trying to to let you in, create your own thing. You have you have full creative over the project and put your best foot forward because you never know who's watching. Like, literally. Yeah, and what's the best thing about your job? The best thing about my job for me is that no day is the same. Like, I could be in, like, Tenerife tomorrow. I could be in Africa tomorrow. I could be working with, like, some underprivileged kids. I could be I could be working with anybody. I get free clothes, whatever. Like, just, I, I just can't have the same day. That's just not my type of personality. So, yeah, I would say that. No day is the same. <laughs> so you couldn't do nine to five in an office? No, nah, that's... That's not for me. I could like I'd go mad. No, not even not at all. Not even halfway. <laughs> Celia, uh, Celia, what about you? What What's your advice to anybody that wants to be a writer? I'd just say if you love writing, keep writing. Like don't give up. There's always stuff to learn with every single thing that you write. Um, if you do start submitting to schemes or sending your work out to places or 
publishing your own content, you know, it's not always going to be, it's not necessarily going to be a hit immediately. Like, so keep going. If you love it, keep going, keep pushing. And uh, what's the best thing about your job? Um, I think it's collaborating with like brilliant people. Like I like working with people that I really admire and I think are really like, cool and smart and I can learn stuff from because yeah it is always it's about learning more and more all the time just getting better there's definitely a theme here you've all said working with different people it's it's not I'm right to say it's not an industry where you can just get by on your own no no definitely not yeah. no. you need teams do, do get that yeah, just like, like Oliver said earlier, like we need that. Like my philosophy is I do what I'm good at, you do what you're good at, and then we all collaborate on one piece of project and it, it should be amazing. Yeah, you you kind yeah, of like great. really need like lots of different roles to kind of gel together to make a TV show. I think like Celia said earlier, like I had no idea how many roles were in the television industry. Like I didn't know my role existed. I, I sometimes watch TV now and I'm like, oh my God, like someone would have found that person that is on that show and you can't it kind of yeah it just feels weird even now yeah. right let's go to the q and i can tell you we're getting loads of questions and answers so hopefully we'll get to read out as many as possible eloise asks for the writers especially do you ever get self-conscious that other people whether they be directors or the audience won't like what you've written do you get used to that I think like self-doubt is probably one of the biggest parts of it. <laughs> like you never feel like, oh, everyone's going to love this. You, gen generally, I'm like, everyone's going to hate this. <laughs> but the thing is, it's the passion that drives you. Like I'm, I'm not going to do something unless I feel like I love it. So naturally what happens is that, that like bleeds through. If you love it, other people generally will as well. But the self-doubt is a huge part of it, I would say, for sure. Oliver? Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd agree. I mean, Celia said it earlier. That you, firstly, on a, on a literal production sense, you're always going to have notes. It doesn't matter who you are. Like, um, uh, you know, Martin McDonough gets notes. Like, a, a, anyone, like, any writer gets notes. Like, the... the um, and that's really hard that's a really hard process to go through because everyone feels like they're saying you know good and then on honestly on the release side i mean god you know this is like this is the internet age the things the things some people say about you on on, on the internet just for having <laughs> released the film yeah you know and and you gotta i guess you've got to accept that that's as he said not everyone's gonna like it but the thing is the, the almost the worst response you can do to that is to try and make something that everybody's going to like because there's no such thing and you you'll just make something that's like the yeah. most vanilla thing you've ever seen like keep what is good about you and your voice and put it out there and you know honestly in, in terms of if we're talking about making a career all that really matters is that somebody who wants to make a tv show of it likes it um or a film of it um you know and then and then everyone else's response is um you know uh that's up to them but i can tell you that writing anything or directing anything or doing any, any of our jobs is is hard work and i think a lot of the people who you know who who would poo poo it don't like know that and and you know you just got to keep going i guess if you were everyone's cup of tea you'd be a mug um daya asks what are your experiences with networking any tips um Alicia, you, you you mentioned networking before. I used yeah. to, I really struggled with networking when I started out in the radio industry. So what's your tips? Because I always dreaded it. I know it's hard. It's a, it's always a weird one, isn't it? But we are so lucky now, um, especially for especially in in the TV and film industry, just with Facebook and and social media in general. So like on Facebook, there are like. I'd say sort of like 30 groups, TV groups, specifically for, you know, entry level jobs, producer jobs, like there's a kind of a group for everything really. So I think, yeah, just if, if you are looking to network and you're kind of looking to get into the industry, join all of the Facebook groups. I think if you kind of literally just type in TV and film jobs, you, there'll be lots that come up. So definitely kind of do that. 
and, and don't be afraid to, like I said before, I know it sounds a bit weird, but just if you are, if you like a company, if you see a TV company and you like the shows that they make, you know, write an email, um, get in contact with them, you know, ask if they're looking, if you haven't got any experience, ask if they're looking to someone, you know, to take on as work experience or, you know, an assistant, um, you know, and you can get in that way. But I do think like, persistence is key and like if you do email someone and, and you show that you're passionate about something then yeah that they are you know hopefully they will take you on yeah I think a dm can be quite powerful as well sometimes it can no, be not, not, not like a weird be. sliding into dm but a dm is Always. quite a powerful way as well uh, yeah. definitely um Catherine asks do you guys have any tips or recommendations for getting internships or placements in the film TV industry. Cordell, you mentioned an internship. Is that right? Is that how you started off? Yeah, I, I applied for something called Mama Youth um, and they do it twice a year. So half of the placements go to Sky and half of the placements go to the BBC. So that would be a okay. good Okay. Also, another way where I've got a job, I was trying to find an image for one of these things earlier, but I just, I don't know what to tap into Google to get it. I don't know. I don't know if any of you guys in here have, have have actually seen this thing, but sometimes when I'm driving, I see these little luminous tags on the poles that will show you where which way to go to wherever the production is in that area. Before, I've literally found an office and dropped my CV to the production manager because I found a cabin and got a job out of it. So that's another reason. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Uh, oh, there's so, so many questions coming in. Uh, I've just been told as well, you can check out Mama Youth and Creative Accessors and follow BBC Get In on Instagram as they have loads of different schemes. So that's Mama Youth and Creative Access and follow BBC Get In on Instagram. And like Cordell said, there's, there's different interns on there. Cha okay, next Channel four. question. Oh, sorry, Jordan. Channel, Channel 4, 4 also have a really good um, sort of like entry level scheme. And I know a couple of people that have done that and are producers now. So definitely look on that as well. Yeah, I know some writers. Well, am I right here, Celia? Uh, there's BBC Writers Room, which offers some good opportunities as well. Yeah. yeah. Writers Room on Insta. Yeah, um, there's, there is many out there. Emma asks, how do opportunities come about for you to write and direct? Do you have to make your own opportunities sometimes? Is that kind of what Cordell was saying before, Oliver? You've just got to make your own stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's no, um, particularly if the specific thing you want to do is get a, a feature film off the ground of your own. You know, that's a really, there's no specific path to doing that. It's, it's really hard. And like, it took us, so the first draft of, I was just saying this film that has come out for me, School's Out Forever. The first draft of that I wrote 10 years ago. And I wrote about 15 to 20 drafts of that over the course of 10 years for different like financiers and different potential people who were going to make it. And that's possibly more technical than you need to know. But the thing is, yeah, you, you kind of just, um, firstly, again it sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier about don't write something just because you think it might get made if you're going to spend 10 years you know writing something it's got to be something you love and pushing that one thing um so yeah you've got to yeah. you've got to kind of um orig originate it yourself it doesn't necessarily have to be I mean in the case of as I say that that film it was a book first and we just directly contacted the writer and there's a whole um, three act saga I could go through about the, the whole process of, get, of getting that made but the point is we reached out to, to him and eventually got the rights to, to, to write the script um, but if it's your own idea um, that's fine just I would say just it's just about making sure that your voice is there on the page and your intention of, for why it's going to be a good film is there on the page so that when the whoever it is the executive or the funding body or the whatever whoever, or the even the actor or whoever it is that you want to get involved in the film goes to read it it's not just a good like it's not just a story on this page that makes sense it's gives a feeling of what the film's actually going to be like you know like um, okay. uh, Sin City would it would be a very different script to Gone with the Wind on the page you know and hopefully each would give the person an idea of what film they were going to end up being in or financing or, or whatever. Um, I, ho I hope that answers the question, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. I, lo I love this question. Um, and I think it's a really good one. Um, the 
I can kind of relate to. Do you need to be, it's from Anonymous, do you need to be based in London to work in TV and film? Are there any opportunities outside of London? Um, any guys want to answer that? Yeah, I, I, I just quickly say absolutely not. Like I actually started um, my TV career in, well, I was in Manchester. Um, so I definitely think, I mean, yeah, um, like it is harder maybe to get jobs sometimes sort of like outside of the bigger cities. But, you know, a lot of TV companies now do look for people, you know, in, in other areas. So I think, yeah, I think if you're in a smaller city, if you're in a smaller town, city, like you'll, you'll still be able to do it as long, yeah, just email the right people and, and do it that way. Yeah, I, think, and I know my experience is totally different, um, but it's the same for me. I'm a, I'm a proud Northerner and you don't have to, you don't, it, you, it's not perfect, don't get me wrong, both the TV, radio and film industry, like it is getting better, but it's not, uh, it's not being so London focused and I know the BBC are moving to Birmingham and I got my first job in Salford. Um, there was actually working in TV and radio. So they are getting better. You've got Channel 4 moving up to Leeds. So I, I certainly would say um, to the younger generation now, I, I really don't think you have to be based in London. I actually had a, a meeting today with a TV executive who's like a well-known TV exec. And I was shocked to find out that he lives in Preston in Lancashire. And he just commutes. And he's lived there for the past... A uh, few years, so yeah, I don't think you have to be um, be based in London now. There's so many opportunities outside, uh, and yeah. yeah, no, I was going to say no, no, no. I'm so sorry to cut you off, but I was going to say it's a requirement now sometimes on shows that you don't live in London, which I think is really good. So, like specifically, if a job is posted. Um, they will say we're only looking for applicants that are based outside of the M25. So, so you know, a lot of jobs are now sort of seeking regional talent in our industry, which I think is yeah, amazing. Yeah, rap rap game series oh. three is really at the moment, isn't it? It's not. Yeah. Highly yeah, yeah, yeah. Popular. Yeah. Yeah, we just finished. We just finished the rap game. We just finished filming it, and like the majority of the crew were, were from outside the M25, which mm. is great. And. Um, since all this madness, when I got back from Wales, a lot of the TV shows I've like that have been on, we've travelled up to Salford to film them and stuff. So there's a lot being filmed um, up there. Um, Saffron asks, as a writer, do you recommend getting an agent in this industry? Celia? I think if you want to start working on shows and also if you want production companies to feel like you're less risky, it's definitely helpful to have an agent. They won't necessarily start your career. You have to do that first yourself. So you have to generate interest in yourself because at the end of the day, it's a business for them and they take clients on to make a commission off your earnings. So they need to know that you'll be bringing in earnings. But yeah, like it is very helpful. It really is like, for example, um, I wouldn't have got the role on EastEnders if I didn't have an agent because that all came through approaching agents to look for new writers and things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's very helpful, but it won't start your career. You have to do that first. Uh, 100% agree. Tell it that. Sorry, so, no, Oliver, go on. Sorry, continue. Go on. No, I just, uh, no, sorry. As I literally said I 100% agree with every word of that it, it won't it won't start things for you but it's obviously very helpful once you once you're up and running um and you just get used to the cut that they take from your age every month you do get used <laughs> to it after a while but you still every now and then go <laughs> um am i right <laughs> um <laughs> tilly may asks any tips on how to ace interviews cordell you said your first interview was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> was it that bad? Was it, was, it really no, that bad, mate? Do you know what? Like the, the last two jobs I had previously, I actually knew the manager, so I didn't have an interview. And I didn't realise that until I actually sat in the interview. I literally researched everything about the company, knew it. But then when I sat in the chair, I literally forgot everything. Like, but um, I'd say just be yourself. Like, do you know like. I feel like most of the times when you're when you're in an interview, you're kind of put under so much pressure because you're more focused on saying the right thing as opposed to saying what really means something to yourself. 
and I, and every time I've I've ever just been true to myself when I've answered a question, that's what's more landed me the job over me focus on focusing on giving them the correct answer that they want to hear. So it's just. I'll, Am I right in saying? No, sorry. Go on. Sorry. No, I was done. I was done. Uh, as I say, am I right in saying, um, and this is for, I suppose, all of you as well as you, Cardell, um, is, uh, do most of your roles come from interviews or is it from knowing people and networking and doing mm. a good job on one? Do you, is a lot of your jobs from interviews? Mine is, is a combination, to be honest. Uh, most of, because what I, most of what I do is visual, most of the time, once somebody sees what I'm capable of, I'll, I'll get the job anyway. If, if it's not that, it's always a recommendation. I can't remember the last time I've actually got a job through and like a thorough interview like that. Even like yeah. I just a documentary with Vice, but it was the series director that I worked on with from another job was the one that recommended me for it. So it was kind of like I got an in from that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the Alicia, writing... have you done many interviews? Sorry, I go think, on, Celia. I was just going to say with the writing, it's often like it's a bit of both as well. You can get recommendations, but also you tend to have general meetings rather than interviews. So if a production company is looking for a writer on a show, um, they'll cast a wide net out and they'll call general meetings with you. Um, so it's, it's not as formal as an interview, but it's kind of the same thing. They want to get to know you. But I was also going to say, don't be afraid to take notebooks in an interview. If there are things that you really want to say and you're worried you might forget, like I've even been on the side of interviewing and when people haven't had notebooks, I've sort of been like, oh, haven't you got any notes? So don't, don't be afraid to take notes in. And if it's on Zoom like this, you can be surrounded by notes and post-its everywhere. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we've got um, a, a great question here uh, from Anonymous. Um, I think it's for you, Alicia. What's the difference between a casting director and a casting producer? And what do you look forward, um, what do you look for when making a show? Yeah, um, I think so. So I predominantly work in um, re sort of factual, factual entertainment reality. So I, instead of finding sort of actors and actresses, I will find um, you know sort of like your everyday person that that's on TV. So people that don't have any sort of acting experience usually. Um, I kind of just. I look for a variety of different things. I think with my job, like you just have to be good at like spotting you know, a good character and, and someone with like a really interesting story. So I always look for people, you know, they don't have to be sort of like really outgoing or bubbly necessarily. I just look for people with, you know, interesting stories to tell and, and people that are willing to kind of communicate that on TV really. But yeah, I just think it depends what show it is. Cause sometimes I could be looking for, you know someone that wants to be on The Voice and wants to be, you know w win The Voice and wants to be, you know an amazing singer. But I also, you know, might be casting a show where for pregnant people, for example. So that's a different type of cast. But yeah, it kind of, it depends really. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for one more question. So if we can make this um, the last one, I think we'll go for, do we have any more questions? Uh, okay. This is from Megan and she asks, how do you keep yourself motivated to write? and not lose faith in your project. Oliver, Celia, who wants to go first? Because I can imagine sometimes you can lose faith and maybe not look at a piece for a couple of years, or I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, when it's your own project, sometimes that can happen. But I think you've just got to try, you've got to push through that at the end of the day. If you want to make, make it work you've got to push through and keep working but then if you're working on a show that exists you kind of can't really have that lull you've just got to do it like you have to think of it as a job you've just been hired to do something so you've kind of got to do it but with your own stuff yeah it definitely happens but I think it's just you just have to remember remember to be confident and believe in yourself sounds cheesy but if you believe in yourself and know, like, I can do this, I'm good at this, and I'm going to work for it, 
then that's a strong motivator as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, I agree with that. And uh, the, the only other thing I'd say is that don't be afraid. If, if it is your own project, um, as CB says, it's very different if it's, a, if it's a TV thing, you've got to get out the door. But if it is your own project, don't be afraid also is part of the process of keeping the passion for it alive step away from it from a, for a while and come back to it because you'd be amazed what that'll do for like um with with, with the this film i was saying it took 10 years to get made one of those years we weren't doing anything on it i got i got booked up completely with vfx work and i just went right i'm not going to touch it for a year came back and the draft after that was so much better than the one before because you can see the the wood for the trees to use the old phrase like so so as part of that process don't be afraid to just give it a rest for a while um and just make sure as Celia says that you keep enough enough in you that you you do come back to it and don't just abandon it can i just add um, something great you, thank you not as a writer but of course i feel like kind of something that kind of coincides with that is like just pushing forward to the next step so like I, I kind of feel like that sometimes as well. I might get like a bigger project or, you know, you just kind of want to level up. Like, and it's like, oh, am I ready for that? I don't know. Like, just, just like the typical saying, feel the fear and just do it anyway. Like, because there's nothing in the world that can prepare you for like elevating at the moment. And and to coincide with that again, it's like, take the loads with the highs, like the, the, the ocean that we see, or if you don't see, I don't know, whatever. It can't roar 24-7. Sometimes it has to be still and then sometimes it has to roar. So you have to kind of have to ride the waves and like, take the opportunities as they come. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, Alicia, just any final words of encouragement before we finish? Um, I just think it doesn't matter like what you're doing right now. Like I have, if you kind of fancy a career change or like, I've got loads of friends. Like, I, I've got a friend that's 32 and, you know, was, was in like, she worked in sort of like an office job and is now kind of started an entry level TV job. So uh, it doesn't matter how old you are or what you're doing right now. It doesn't matter if you're working in a bank, a restaurant, a bar, if you do want to change it, like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how old you are basically or what qualifications you have. Just go for it. You only live once. Guys, seriously, thank you so much for your time today. I know you're all pretty busy. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. So thank you to you, to you all. That brings us to the end of the session. Thanks again to you guys, our great panellists. And thanks to you that have been watching at home as well. You've got some really good questions. I remember if you've enjoyed the session, tell everyone about it. Give us, give us a tweet. Let people know. Uh, uh, and tell all your friends as well if they'd be interested in it. You can. What was the YouTube channel? The BBC Careers YouTube. So this will go up on BBC Careers YouTube channel after this. So, guys, that's the end of the session. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Cordell. And thank you, Oliver. Cheers, guys. Thank you, guys. See you later. Bye.